Gentlemen, miners, lady golfers, welcome to Hooter Search 97. I am your host, Mr. Wildcat, all dressed up in his cabana wear for what is going to be a nudie bar themed episode this week. Okay. Now, finally back reviewing season 11 after taking a break while the Married Children podcast reviewed the Breaking Up Trilogy in over a three-week period. And I invite you guys to go check it out if you have not done so. It is my favorite episode of the entire show's run. And I explain why when I review with Matt and Annabelle in part two of it. Okay? Anyway, today we are going to be entering the final third of Married with Children's 11th season. Today we are going to be kicking off with Live Nude Peg. All right, a nudie bar themed episode. Uh, this was the 12th episode to be produced for season 11, but it was the 17th to air in the show's run. This episode was recorded on November 22nd, 1996, and original air date March 10th of 1997. A couple things I will add, and we'll also go a little bit into it when I go through my trivia notes and stuff. But basically, um, not only is this the last episode of the show's run to be directed by Amanda Bears. She had the honors of directing quite a handful of episodes throughout the second half of the show's run. Uh, but this is her last episode. But also, this is the last time we get to see No Ma'am. It's also the last time we see appearances from Ike, Bob Rooney, and Officer Dan. Aww. And after today, the only uh, mem well, we, we never hear of No Ma'am again, but the only people that we still get to see a few members of the No Ma'am crew. And those are Jefferson and Griff, the only two no mammers that we will see after today uh, for the rest of our episodes of season 11. And you're never going to hear no ma'am ever again. So we're going to make the most of it. Okay. So basically, um, uh, we'll go through the A part, plot for the most part. And then like, like the A and the B plot, they basically, it goes back and forth. But I'm going to, but in order to under, give a better understanding for the episode, we'll go through the A plot, and then and then most of the A plot first. Then we'll go a little bit. Then we'll talk about the B plot story, which is not that long, and then we'll finish with the remainder of the A plot. Okay. So we start the episode off with in the Jiggly Room. I think we we have Ike and we have Officer Dan holding one of the strippers up in the air, okay, and the no mammers are playing limbo up on the stage, okay? But basically Jefferson, <laughs> but the main objective for limbo, okay, your job is supposed to get your whole body, while the music's playing, you're supposed to get your whole body below the um, pole that is up above, okay? Without even touching it. You touch it, you're out of the game. Of course, Jefferson was having too much fun, and he basically wound up rubbing his head all on the stripper as he was going underneath her. Say, I didn't make it. <laughs> and basically, we have Iqbal who comes up and wants to talk to Al about an amateur night that's coming up, a jiggly contest. Okay. Al is not. He's a little suspicious because, oh, come on, Iqbal. Uh, don't tell me you're going to charge an undercover charge and then you have us. Didn't the last time you had us pay an uncover charge and then a cover charge or vice versa? And Iqbal says, oh, you're, su oh, you're such a whiner. I was going to ask you to judge the contest. Oh, sign me up, Big Ball. You know, for a guy who requires an 18-drink minimum, you're sure a wonderful guy to be with. <laughs> Jefferson screams, Raise the bimbo! It's time to limbo! 
and they're back to playing limbo on the stage. Then when we come back, uh, the ne after we go to commercial and the intro, we come back and Peggy is uh, in the uh, living room, and Marcy comes in uh, with some music that um, okay. She brings some along some Kenny G music. It hits the sp it hits the spot if you know what I mean. <laughs> God, I hate Kenny G. <laughs> but anyway, um, Al comes down the stairs. He's wearing his no man shirt and a sports jacket. Ooh, Al, you're looking wonderful, nice. Oh, I'm judging the Hooter. I'm judging the Hooters uh, contest at the Jiggly Room. Future Hooters are in my hands. <laughs> and then um, he winds up walking off, and he's. <laughs> And then basically Marcy talks about like, where's Jefferson? Always judging the contest too, but I had him meet me in chambers first. Then Marcy starts questioning uh, what, about how Peggy allows Elle to do what she's doing. And then apparently um, Peggy decides to, okay, being jealous that Elle is spending more time with um, dancer with hooters and attractive women at the nudie bar than he is with his own wife. He decides to prove to Al that she can be as slutty and attractive as these other women. So she decides to go undercover, participate and participating in this jiggly contest, um, and then she'll wear a veil to cover her face. Okay. Well, I guess her uh, guidance counselor was right all along. Exotic dancer. <laughs> so you're going to be a stripper? Well, I guess my guidance counselor was right. <laughs> we then go back to the uh, Jiggly Room. Igbal is about to get the show up and running. Gentlemen, miners, lady golfers, welcome to Hooter Search 97! I am your host, Iqbal. And now, here is a man who inspires the world full of hooters, Al Bundy. He gets up, yeah! <laughs> and then basically he talks about how, in the case of a tie, there, um, the tiebreaker will be decided by peanut butter wrestling. Griff then says, oh, <laughs> oh there will be a tie. And Griff's got the gif. <laughs> he's, got an a he's got an actual jar of peanut butter that says gif on it. And yes, gif is a legitimate brand of peanut butter. Okay. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty too. Let's go. <laughs> so then uh, basically the first um, dancer comes up. And oh my god. Ike finds this finds this one attractive. Okay, first dancer to come up is basically Ch her name is Chesty Larue. All right, oh my God, so ugly looking. All right, this girl is got to be at least sixty seven years old. She's on a stretcher, and her she got very curly hair, and she's a very old woman. He talks about. I used to entertain the troops. Al asks, Union or Confederate? <laughs> um, indicating that, Al, Al's um, indicating that basically Chesty had entertained the soldiers in the U.S. Civil War that broke out from 1861 to 1865. This is about 135 years prior to this episode. Okay. And for those of you wondering what the U.S. Civil War is, it's basically um, the North versus South sli um, decision over like whether slavery should be used, I mean, what black people should be used for slavery and stuff like that. Okay, and cotton and production, um, material production. Okay, South feel like slavery and manual labor was the way to do things. While the North felt like machines and automated um, 
mechanics were the way to handle th were, were the way to make things possible and there was a huge dispute over everything and the next thing you know many of the southern states they succeeded from the U they succeeded from the United States and the next thing you know we're going to war for the next four years okay Confederates um, got off to a strong start and then they make their way up to Gettysburg Pennsylvania the Union uh, fights back and that's the turning point where the Union gets mo they were able to stop the Confederates up at Gettysburg and the next thing you know the Union's making their way back down south and then by 1865 Jefferson Davis who was the leader of the Confederacy he winds up surrendering the Civil War is over and the United States is reunited once again and then Abraham Lincoln got assassinated of course but that's a quote but that's this that's the basics of what the Civil War is about I never actually got to learn about the Civil War in school for reasons which I won't go into but uh, so I can't really go much more into that okay but basically, I used to entertain FDR. I invented the lap dancing now. She puts her heads up in the air. Her dentures <laughs> fall out, and it falls right into this pitcher of beer um, that's sitting right next to Al. Okay? And luckily, there's hardly any beer in the pitcher. Al looks at the camera. All oh, the humanity. The next scene we know we and the next uh, contestant for amateur night, um, much younger, more attractive woman. This is the one I would have voted for. Um, she's got medium to long red hair. She's dancing around to to, to a light jazz music, and she's tapping on her shoes. Da, 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 da. And the next thing you know, she's uh, down on the, she's f f f down on the stage. Uh, and her hooters are doing a tap dance of its own to conclude the number. <laughs> so then they feel like this is going to be the win uh, this is going to be a um so like Al says, "Oh, I think we may have a winner." And I goes, "Chesty." And then basically it might gets hit in the head. But then Iqbal comes up and says, Hey, ladies and gentlemen, we have a late entry. It's Jasmine. Okay, so we have j this lady Jasmine who's wearing a veil, a purple s uh, skirt and costume, dancing to Arabian music. <laughs> and Al is so attractive. Where have you been all my life? So then all the... Uh, and then after... Uh, a brief dance with the Jasmine, who, by the way, is Peggy. For those who don't haven't noticed by now, basically we have all of the uh, dancers. There's probably about six, at least six or seven ladies up on the stage, and the No Man crew is basically um, tabulating the votes. And Al makes his announcement, ladies and gentlemen, we have a winner, and a no doubt my favorite of them all. Jasmine. So Jas Jasmine is uh, all d all excited while the other girls have a very dirty look on their face, and then Jasmine goes up to Al and says, "I want to show you something." Oh, I want to show you something too, but I got to get home to my wife. He runs home, and then Peggy, knowing that he that Al's going to be there waiting for her, or, or waiting for him, she races home too. And she barely makes it home just in time for Al. For Al, she, Peggy makes it in the house first, then followed by Al. And she gets all of her. She gets her costume off and her pajamas on and in the, the bed. I say, "Hi, Al. Don't talk. Turn on. Need you now." And they base he hops on Peggy, and basically has the best sex that these two have ever had. That was the best night since ever. There's plenty more where that came from, baby. And then Peggy falls asleep. <gasps> Peg. <laughs> next um, scene. Oh, before we go to the next scene, let's take a short commercial break, shall we? And 
and we're back. <laughs> so then we have Peggy and Marcy that are in the, um, they're in the kitchen and they're sitting at the dining table. And Marcy asks about how, um, Al, I mean, what was Al's reaction to when he found out that it was Peggy in that costume? And Al, Peggy then confesses that she um, didn't reveal her true identity because it really turned Al on. And Marcy's t telling uh, Peggy, like, Peggy, this is not a good idea because you are, um, okay, he's fantasizing about a stripper. Not you. Yes, but that stripper is me. <laughs> okay. So then later that night, we're back in the Bundy living room. No, no, the Bundy bedroom, that is. Okay. Um, Al is sitting there waiting for Peg. Peg, I'm home. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Daddy's home from the nudie bar. Peggy comes running in. She's wearing a black jacket. And, of course, her... Jasmine costume is hiding underneath, so basically, she's trying to find a way out of it. Oh, hi. Where have you been? Well, I was at Marcy's barn his jacket. Al wants some more sex, but Peggy has to get rid of her costume. So, she tries to distract Al by sending him into the bathroom to... Now, that's going to someplace really romantic. The bathroom. No, they're not having sex in the bathroom. He's actually going to brush his teeth and rinse or, or gargle while um, uh, Peggy has just enough time to take off her costume and hide it under the bed. Okay, So they're basically now in the bed. There's one little problem now. The veil. I mean, Jasmine's veil is on the bed. When Peggy took off, when Peggy went to take off her costume and hide the costume under the mattress, she forgot the veil dr fell out of the pile, and she forgot to hide it before Al came out of the bathroom. Okay, so Peggy's uh, covers blown, right? No, not exactly, because Al thinks that he had dropped at, um. Jasmine's veil. Um, he he must have. He probably grabbed the veil when he, he felt like he grabbed Jasmine's veil at the nudie bar, and it fell out of his pant pocket when he had got home into the bedroom. Okay. So now the two of them are trying to find a way to distract each other in an effort to try to hide the to, to um, hide the veil, or at least get rid of it. They decide. I got it. I'll turn the lights off. Okay. Oh, ew. Oh, Peg. Oh, ew. Oh, Jasmine. What? He called me Jasmine, that son of a bitch. I'm going to kill that son of a bitch. Oh, no. I call her Jasmine. I better do what she loves. So basically, he's uh, grabbing... Peggy's tush, like she really, the way she really loves it, all right? Ooh, he's doing the thing I like, okay? Next scene, Peggy and Marcy are in the Bundy living room. They're talking on the couch, okay? You actually, you mean to tell me that Al actually called out Jasmine's name in bed? That bitch! That bitch Jasmine's ruining my marriage. Peggy, that bitch is you! <laughs> so now, Peggy knows what she has to do. She has to come out with it. She has to reveal her, the truth to Al. But she's going to hold on for another night or two because... Uh, because if she can hold on just a little bit longer, she can buy this one thing that she, she can, I think it's like jacket or ja um, purse or something that she, uh, that costs a lot of money that she's been wanting. 
she's raking in a lot of money. Like she, the first night that she's been doing this, two hundred forty dollars in tips, and she also got a watch, a Timex to be exact. Okay. So um, we then head back to the nudie bar, and apparently Ike has romantic feelings for Chester. I mean, Chesty. Is that her name? Chet. He's basically uh, got, got the romantic feelings for Chesty. So they're t the, the two of them are sitting together at the table. Oh, I, oh, Chesty, I... <laughs> okay, basically talking about how she's out of control. She's still got the moves. I can't... Unfortunately, most of them are involuntary. Okay. <laughs> Jefferson then comes out of the back room and right, right, is on his way to go sit at the table. And then she, he gets stopped by Chesty. Hey, why don't you go stray? You'll never stray. And she, and Jefferson <laughs> kicks her off of him. And then we see Griff and Al at another table. And then Al's counting this big water cash. Al, where'd you get that money? From Peg's best dresser. All of a sudden, she's got a whole bunch of money laying around. Then we see Jasmine up on the stage. <laughs> she then comes over to Al. Oh, I think Jasmine's got a thing for Al here. And then Al tries to um, put some money in Jasmine's G-string. And then Jasmine lures Al up onto the stage. Okay. You know, Jasmine, you're you know you're a much better than that cartoon Jasmine. And we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Okay. So Jasmine has Al on the chair, covers Al's face with her red cloth or something that she's been using to Wayne for dancing. I don't know what I don't know what it's called, but if you guys know what it is, please let me know. Don't look, you'll see it all soon. She Jasmine then takes off the veil to reveal her identity, and guess what? It's Peggy. First, we see Ike and Chesty in a shocking mode, and even more shocking. We see Bob Rooney and Officer Dan in a horrified look. Are you look? Are you <laughs> are you seeing it all, guys? And then we see like Officer Dan, Jefferson, and Griff. Oh yeah! You know, Jasmine, I wish I could have you, but I have to tell you, I'm a married man. Oh, I don't care. Neither do I. And she takes that cloth and she chokes Al in the neck. And then he basically talks about, uh, she he's all turned on and stuff. You know, Jasmine, I'm really turned on and I want you and all, but I gotta go home to my wife. What do you want to see me about, Al? <laughs> ah! What'd you do with Jasmine? I didn't do anything with her. You killed her, didn't you? You killed her because you didn't want to see me happy. I am Jasmine, you idiot. No, you can't be. Jasmine's one, Jasmine's a beautiful woman. You're just a wife. That's right, Al. Now your fantasy and your wife are one and the same. So now anytime you think of Jasmine, you're going to think of me. No! Al tries to run away and then Peggy <laughs> tries to hold him back. Those are the ending credits. Then we go into the epilogue. Um, before the actual credits. Al and Peg are in bed. All right? And uh, they're about to fool around. And then uh, Al asks if he can wear the veil. <laughs> and then they go back to having sex. Okay? That's the A-plot for you. Okay? So that's the end of the episode. And that's the A-plot. The B-plot, all right, something I wasn't too fond of. But, and it doesn't really have anything to do with the A-plot at all. But I'll get more into that when I go do my review. But basically, um, 
Kelly is a trying out for this part. She's going to be the before girl for a diet ad or something of some kind. And she's got to gain 30 pounds in about a week or so. So, at, so Bud, who is her agent, is trying to help her gain the weight. All right. They're carrying around all of this junk food. Oh, my God. I don't know how Kelly can eat this, and quite frankly, it makes it, some of it does make me sick to my stomach. Okay, ranges anywhere from pork rinds to big ch chicken and stuff on a stick. You also have cheese in a can, like those can those big cans of cheese. You spray inside. Okay, that is gross. And then we have this big bowl. Okay. Kelly thinks it's vanilla ice cream. That is the worst vanilla ice cream I ever had. Uh, guess what, Peggy? I mean, guess what, Kelly? It's not ice cream. It's Crisco. Yeah! Christ. All right. So in between scenes in this B plot. She gains four pounds. only gains four pounds. She should have been gaining much more. And then they go back to eating this stuff. I don't know what the... Oh, I am so grossed out. But then at the end, towards the end of the episode, okay, um, Kelly eventually got fired from the episode. I mean, she got fired from her role. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that the weight was gained unevenly. Right. Instead of the weight showing up in her belly like it should have been, it all went to her ass. It was such a huge... Kelly now has a huge ass. And she's saying to... And she's screaming to Al, I mean, to Bud. Well, if you had let... If you allowed me to stand up, it all wouldn't have gone to my butt! Okay, and then she sits there crying about how she was in the grocery store. She turned around and knocked over the Pringles pyramid. And then she starts sitting on the couch eating bonbons. And then Bud, being the insensitive brother and agent that he is, tells Kelly, you know, you might feel better if you stop if you stopped with the snacking. Oh, that's it. You are one dead son of a bitch. And then basically he says, Hey, Kelly, there's something chasing you. Oh, just kidding. It's just your ass. <laughs> and then Bud gets right up to Kelly and says, You know, you people are supposed to be jolly. Oh, that is it. She knocks Bud to the ground with her butt, and then she starts sitting on it, jumping up and down on her with, his, with her butt. Okay? Oh, my God. Thank God I talked about We got that done in a nutshell. So now, why, so now that we get everything done here, why don't we... It was a weight loss commercial, all right? Is basically what it was, okay? Now let's go through the trivia, guys. There, there's a few things to talk about here. So. so this episode title is inspired by the 1995 film Live Nude Girls, all right? Okay, so we need to talk about this a little bit. So, this is what I can come up with, okay? It's a 1995 American comedy film starring Dana Delaney, Kim Cattrall, Cynthia Stevenson, Lala Robbins, Laura Zane, and Olivia Debo. The film writer and director, Juliana Lavin, plays the role of a minor character, okay? This is about a group of childhood friends. They have a sleepover as, as a bachelorette party for Jamie, where the conversations involve from the topic of the relationships with men to sex and related fantasies. The group includes two sisters, Rachel and Jill, between whom remains some emotional tension. The hostess of the evening, the bisexual Georgina, is pestered by her positive live-in lover Chris, who declines to join the party, staying in her bedroom. Okay. 
I don't like that. Okay. Film received mostly negative reviews from critics, but performance is praised by some critics. It had a limited release, grossing only $23,808. Okay. And bear with me, guys, because I want to see what this... This movie does qualify for at least an R rating, but I... I want to see what this movie's rated. It is R. All right. Based on what I was seeing here, I was debating whether or not it was going to be R or NC-17, but it is an R rating. And apparently there's an unrated version out there somewhere. Got to be more raunchy than the R-rated version. Okay. So there you have the... So that's where we got Live Nude Peg from. Okay. And like I mentioned before, this episode marks the final appearance of Nomia, members Ike, Bob Rooney, and Officer Dan, and any references to the organization. From the next episode until the series finale, the only official members left that appear on screen are Jefferson and Griff, and Al, of course. If one looks at the nightstand near Peggy's side after she runs into the room, there's a picture frame with a black and white picture of Al. The picture appears to be a promo picture for season 11. Okay. There are some cultural references to this episode, not that many though. Bud mentions actors Robert De Niro and Tom Hanks and how they gain weight for their roles when trying to convince Kelly to gain weight for her commercial gig. Robert De Niro gains 60 pounds for his role as a professional boxer in the 1980 film Raging Bull, which he wound up winning an Oscar for Best Actor. Tom Hanks gained 30 pounds to play a former baseball player turned women's baseball coach in the 1992 film A League of Their Own. And no offense, guys, that was a horrible movie. Okay. During his discussion about weight gain, Bud says that Free Willy used to be Flipper. Okay. Flipper was a television series about a dolphin, while Free Willy is a 1993 film about a killer whale. Tell you right now, I loved Free Willy when I was a little kid. Watched it recently. What the hell is this about? I've lost my taste for it, unfortunately. When Bud tries to feed Kelly, he mentions that he will get the pork chops from the Fry Daddy. The Fry Daddy is a real product made by Presto. It is a bucket-like deep fryer that cooks at only one temperature for simple, hassle-free cooking. Okay. Last but not least, when Al and the guys watch Jasmine on stage, Griff says, I think Jasmine has a little crush on El Latin here. This is in reference to the characters Aladdin and Princess Jasmine for the 1992 Disney animated film Aladdin. The film is referenced again when Al tells her that she's much prettier than the cartoon Jasmine after she brings him up on stage. We're going to finish our trivia section by briefly talking about the 1992 film Aladdin. Since, okay, this one is kind of focused on, okay? So D Aladdin was one of the many films that aired during the Disney Renaissance between 1989 and 1999. A 1992 American animated musical fantasy comedy film produced by the Walt Disney Animation Company and released by Walt Disney Pictures. Um, it's based on the Arabic folktale of the same name and from the 1001 Nights. The voice cast features Scott Rayner, Robin Williams, Linda Largan, and Jonathan Freeman. Okay. Film follows Aladdin, who is an Arabian street urchin, who finds a magic lamp containing a genie. With the genie's help, Alana disguises himself as a wealthy prince and tries to impress the sultan in order to marry his free-spirited daughter, Princess Jasmine, while the sultan's evil visor, Jafar, plots to steal the magic lamp for his own uses. Okay. The film was released on November 11, 1992, received positive reviews from critics, particularly for Robin Williams' performance. 
It was a commercial success, becoming the highest grossing film of 1992 with an earning of over $504 million in the worldwide box office revenue. Upon release, it was the first animated feature to reach the half billion dollar mark, the highest grossing animated film of all time, until it was surpassed by the next Disney film that would come out, which was The Lion King, a year and a half later in the summer of 1994. Okay. So let's see. Uh, what else can we talk about? Um, it garnered two Academy Awards, as well as other accolades for its soundtrack, which had the first and only number from the Disney feature to earn a Grammy Award for Son of the Year for the films A Whole New World, which was sung by Peebo Bryson and Regina Bell. Okay. Film's first home video VHS release was also also set sales records and grossed about five hundred million dollars in the United States. Aladdin's success led to various derived works and other material inspired by the film, including two direct to video sequels, including The Return of Jafar, which had uh, the genie played by Dan Castiello, who was Homer Simpson in The Simpsons, and then Robin Williams would come back to play the genie again for the for the for the other um, sequel, which was Aladdin and the King of Thieves in 1996. It also um, inspired a animated television series and a Broadway adaptation. A live action film adaptation directed by Gus Ritchie was released on May 24th, 2019. And let's take a look to see which... Uh, so basically it received, let's see, one, two, four Oscar nominations It won two. Best Original Score and Best... Actually got five Oscar nominations, winning two of them. Best Original Score and A Whole New World for Best Original Song. Now, believe it or not, two film, uh, two songs from the film were actually nominated for this uh, Academy Award. So, so the other one was Friend Like Me. You'll never have a friend, never have a friend like me. Don't ask me to sing this shit. All right. One thing I do have to mention, okay, before we um, fin finish our trivia and then go into my rating, okay? One of the verses of the opening song, Arabian Nights, was altered following complaints from the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, or otherwise known as the ADC. The lyrics were changed, okay? The original lyrics in the theatrical release, okay, were they cut off your ear if they don't like your face, okay? That's the lyric that they got really pissed off with. And it was, ch okay, it was changed to where it's flat and immense and the heat is intense, okay? Changing uh, with, the f ch with the change first appearing in the 1993 video release. The original lyric was intact on its initial CD soundtrack release, but the re-releases were they used the edited lyric. Broadway adaptation also uses the edited line. The sequential line, however, it's barbaric, but hey, it's home, was left intact. Entertainment Weekly ranked Aladdin in the list of the most controversial films in history due to this incident. The number has been described in reviews as simultaneously glamorizing and barbarizing the Arab world. The ADC also complained about the portrayal of the lead characters, Aladdin and Jasmine. They accused the filmmakers of angleizing their features and giving them Anglo-American accents, in contrast to the other characters in the film which have foreign accents, grotesque facial features, and appear villainous or greedy. All right. Animation enthusiasts have also noticed similarities between Aladdin and Richard Williams' unfinished uh, film, The Thief and the Cobbler, also known as The Princess and the Cobbler, under allied filmmakers in Arabian Night under Miramax Films. These similarities include a similar plot, similar characters, scenes, and background designs, and the antagonist zigzags resemblance in character design and mannerisms to Genie and Jafar. Though Aladdin was released first, Thief and the Cobbler initially began production much earlier in the 1960s 
and mirrored in difficulties including financial problems, copyright issues, story revisions, and late production times causing by separate studios trying to finish the film after R Richard Williams was fired from the project for lack of finished work. The late release coupled with Miramax purchasing and re-editing the film has sometimes resulted in The Thief and the Cobbler being labeled a ripoff of Aladdin. All right. Now, you did learn a lot today, okay? We're going to now finish, okay? We did learn a lot today. <laughs> but now it's time for me to give you my review for this episode, okay? Now, with this being uh, the last time we get to see No Ma'am and um, Officer Dan and Ike and Bob Rooney, okay? They went all in on this episode, and they did a really good job with it, all right? And uh, it was very interesting to get to see Katie Seagal, who got to make another appearance on the stage without wearing her okay, her red wig. Now, for those of you who do not know, okay, uh, Katie Seagal, when she plays Peggy on Married Children, she usually wears a red wig. That's not her real hairdo, all right? Her real hairdo is what you see in this episode, as well as... Um, in uh, season eight, take my wife, please, when she winds up playing death. All right, that's an episode that I had just reviewed the other day, in honor of Halloween. Okay, so that's a fun one to watch if you have not done so already. Okay, um, basically, um, I thought I thought very highly of this episode. Unfortunately, I did. I absolutely hated the B plot. All right. The B plot didn't really have much to do with the with the A plot. Like, it had nothing to do with it. And Alan, I mean, Bud and Kelly really didn't have much interaction with um, Alan Pegg, all right? Except for the hello, goodbye, and all that shit, all right? And it was absolutely it was absolutely gross watching Bud trying to shove all this junk food down Kelly's throat. This is not what I um, wanted to have wanted to have seen. All right. So I am going to give. I am unfortunately going to have to give a point deduction for uh, the B plot because I'm not too thrilled with it. Whatever at all. So like I was wanting to give this a four, but after everything is said and done, live nude peg is actually going to get a. You know what? Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, um, Live New Peg is actually going to receive a 3.5 out of 5 for me. Okay, I was going to give it like a 4, 4, 4.5, but with the B-plot, I cannot do that. Alright? If the B-plot had not been there, this episode would have qualified for at least a 4. No question about it. Alright? So that is my review for live nude peg, all right? I apologize if you guys are hearing sirens in the back. Anytime something goes on here in Tucson, the uh, <laughs> we hear this just about almost every night, all right? I just learned to live with it. <laughs> so that is um, my episode for today. Um... The next episode of season 11 that Mary, that Mr. Wildcat will be reviewing, as long, along with the Mary Children podcast, will be A Babe in Toyland. All right? And this is going scheduled to hit the air on Wednesday, November 16th. All right? This is a fun episode. And um, I'm going to be, uh, for this particular episode, I will be decking up in my U of A uh, I'm we'll be going. We're going to go going back to college. Uh, we're wearing some gear from my days in the residence hall association, and I get to talk about some of my experiences with it. And I'll tell you, like, why does this have to do with Babe in Toyland? Well, there are some references that that kind of remind me of the two. So, be on the lookout for that. And there's probably going to be another episode, classic episode or two that will be 
hit in the air uh, shortly down the road. If there is a particular episode on Marin Children from this first 10 seasons you like Mr. Wildcat to review, please leave it in the comments below. Until next time we meet, I'm Mr. Wildcat, reminding each and every one of you to be good, be careful, and behave.